today on Inspired Money. Nobody wants to learn about Medicare. It's just like auto insurance. We do it because we have to, but we certainly don't want to learn all that. We really want someone else to just choose it for us, like our employers have done our whole lives. But you don't have that option with Medicare. You've got to figure it out. This is episode 165 with the founder of Boomer Benefits, Danielle Roberts. Welcome to Inspired Money. My name is Andy Wong, a managing partner at Runnymead Capital Management. Each week, we bring you an interesting person to help you get inspired, shift your perspectives on money, and achieve incredible things. From making it to giving it away, Inspired Money means making a difference, creating something bigger than oneself, and maybe, just maybe, making the world a better place. Thank you for joining me. Inspired Money Maker, welcome back. If this is your first time joining us, welcome. We have a very specific topic in this episode. It's Medicare. I want to share this with you because figuring out when to enroll in Medicare and which parts to enroll in can be daunting even for the savviest retirees. If you're younger, arming yourself with this information now will help you be better prepared for the future so you won't run into negative surprises. Or maybe this episode will help you to help your parents who will need help navigating Medicare. If you're like most, you see Medicare deductions coming out of your paycheck every pay period. But do you know what it means? The current tax rate for Social Security is 6.2% for the employer, 6.2% for the employee, or 12.4% total. The current rate for Medicare is 1.45% for the employer and 1.45% for the employee, or 2.9% total. Beyond these numbers, did you know that there's Medicare Part A, Part B, Part D, Medigap plans, Medicare Advantage plans, and so on? Today we're talking with Danielle Roberts, a Medicare expert and the co-founder of Boomer Benefits, a licensed insurance agency that helps baby boomers navigate their entry into Medicare in 48 states. She's the author of the best-selling book, 10 Costly Medicare Mistakes You Can't Afford to Make, which helps beneficiaries avoid critical but all-too-common Medicare pitfalls. In this episode, you'll learn how Danielle became a Medicare expert, a way to smoothly transition from employee to business owner. And you'll get a primer on Medicare, how it works, and what to know in order to plan for the future. Now let's get inspired with Danielle Roberts. Danielle, welcome to Inspired Money. I'm so excited to have you on the show. I'm really happy to be here. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Let's jump right in. What's your earliest childhood memory of money? So when I was a little girl, my dad was sort of an entrepreneurial sort, and he was that way his whole life. He's uh, 73 now, still doing entrepreneurial things. And what we did when I was four was we would go out, uh, this was in Michigan after a rain, and we would collect earthworms. And we lived right on the route to a local lake. So we would sit out there at 6, 6.30 in the morning and sell worms to the fishermen. And that's how my dad taught me the value of money. And of course, all the fishermen saw the cute little girl. And eventually we were able just to leave the cooler uh, out there with the worms in it and on the honor system. And it was really fun because I would go out every morning and check and there would be money in there that people would leave because, of course, they were all happy to buy worms from me instead of the bait store. (laughs) I love how you could automate the sales process. Yeah, we learned that uh, easy way to scale, uh, just uh, sleep and put lots of earthworms out there. (laughs) That is really cool. You're a co-founder at Boomer Benefits and an expert in helping people make sense of Medicare supplemental insurance. What was your path to this very specific niche? I always thought I would enjoy owning my own business someday. I went to TCU and chose a major, double major in English and journalism because those were things that I was good at. But then when I got ready to graduate, I quickly found that you can not survive on what a journalist makes if you have private university student loans to pay back. So I took a job in business, a local staffing agency, and I joined that company when I think I was the fifth person hired 
And today that company employs almost a hundred people. It's a, a multi, multi million dollar business. And so I was able to learn from a really driven entrepreneur, sort of the basics of starting a business and growing it from the ground up and how to do sales and how to over deliver. And I didn't realize this at the time, but Everything that I learned from that man in the 10 years that I worked there really set me up for my own entrepreneurial success later. And about 10 years in, I kind of got burnout on interviewing 50 people a day, putting people to work, and then they would no show the next day. Humans are not a very good product to sell. So I wanted to do something different. And a friend of mine was going to an insurance interview. And I had been looking for probably a year or two, just looking for opportunities and trying to figure out what I would be good at. And I went um, to this group interview where they were teaching you about getting an insurance license and selling health insurance. And I kind of went with her to support that... um, effort on her behalf to get into a new career. And I ended up uh, thinking, hey, this is actually something I would really like to do. I turned my notice in. I sold my house so that I could have some cash to start a new business. And I got an insurance license in the December of 2004 and quickly began selling individual and group health insurance products. Um, My girlfriend and I, and also another friend that had been with us there at the group interview, we kind of worked together in the beginning. And I remember thinking this was a great career because I was selling something that didn't have to sit on a shelf. There was no inventory to, to have to worry about. And I could just sell this idea, you know, a guarantee you get this much coverage if you pay this much premium. And I enjoyed the helpful aspect of it because insurance is very confusing to people. There's things like deductibles and co-insurance and co-pays that people don't understand. And so it was sort of an educational sale and I really enjoyed that aspect of it. And over time, I started having people asking me about their parents. Hey, you helped me with my group plan for my employees here at work. And this seems pretty easy to understand, but my parents are aging into Medicare and man, nobody can understand that stuff. So I looked at it and realized that Medicare really is very confusing. And especially when you've been working your whole life with an employer who provides health insurance to you. And now you're dumped onto this national health insurance system that you've got to figure out on your own. And it has four different parts and 10 different Medicare supplements and thousands of options. And you're 65 and you have no idea how to figure any of this out. It was really just the perfect opportunity waiting to happen because back then people still sold insurance across the kitchen table. You would go out to someone's home, sit down, teach them Medicare, show them the products. We used to have to flip through rate books to find the rates for people. It was before Facebook. It was before digital quoting systems. And I did that for a while. And I thought to myself, you know, I've bought my insurance for homeowners and auto insurance, and I'm doing that online why isn't anyone selling this product, Medicare products online? I think I could do that. And I invited my brother to come and join me. He was selling mortgages at the time in Michigan. And it was right close to when the refi boom was kind of starting to settle down and he could see the writing on the wall. And he'd been very successful doing that. And I said, you know, you should come down here and run the business side and I'll do the sales and uh, marketing. And we could really make a a team effort of this. And he was always involved in my entrepreneurial endeavors as a kid. So I knew his work ethic and he came down and we worked in the business for five years together before we hired our first employee. And uh, today, 14, 15 years later, we have 65 employees and we sell policies in 48 states and we have over 30,000 policyholders at this time. So it was just like I walked in at the perfect moment to take things digital, to sort of see the opportunity and also have a great person to partner with that had the same work ethic I did and could make a go of this with me. That's really cool. So it's a family business story. Is selling the supplemental insurance online like selling the worms? (laughs) You know, in one aspect, it is in that people want to find someone that they can trust and that they like to buy their policies from. And then they don't really want to think about the policy that much after that point. And so if you can see the opportunity is to help someone with something confusing, 
give them an opportunity for customer service on the back end so that when things pop up, they don't have to get too deep into the weeds, figuring out where to call between Medicare and their doctor's office about some claim that wasn't covered. They can just reach out to you. If you can just make that connection of being a nice person that is competent to handle this particular task, you can do really well in the insurance industry. And it sort of is like selling worms because the fishermen knew they would be able to drive by and that I would have have a little cooler full of worms out there for them. And they would pay me because I was a cute little girl and they could see the entrepreneurial thing that my dad was teaching me. And so in that aspect, you know, a lot of people that are good at sales are just personable. And I learned that really early on and have implemented that in my business, uh, the entire journey from being a tiny little two person company to an eight figure business. It's a, it's a, it's a great story. And I love how it's your dad's sort of entrepreneurial spirit that carries on through you and your brother. That's right. I just want to take a quick step back. How scary was it selling your house to start your business? Oh, totally scary, especially because I also was quitting my job at the same time. And so I moved in with a friend. And I think, though, one of the things that I did that really made the leap very easy for me to make was that I went to my employer that I had worked for, the entrepreneur that I told you about, and I explained to him that I wanted to go and start my own business. And I just said, look, I'm leaving. Um, It doesn't have to be right now. It can be a few months from now. But here's this one little aspect of the business that I handle that I've handled for years and I'm really good at. What if you gave me a part-time job and helped me keep my insurance and I'll continue to manage this one little piece, which for them was their workers' comp insurance. And in the staffing industry, especially in light industrial, there's workers' comp claims that happen every day. And a business owner in that industry has to manage those and not just let them run rampant. And I'd been doing that for him for for years. And he agreed. Uh, so he was, you know, kind enough to see that I wasn't going to stay. He tried to offer me a sales position with them and I didn't want to sell the human capital like I explained. And I told him that. <laughs> um, and I took that job with me. I think he paid me like $25,000 a year or something. It was just enough to keep the lights on. And it made it a little bit less scary, but certainly also having that the cash from selling my home allowed me to invest in leads earlier than I might've otherwise been able to do that for my business. And so all those things kind of came together to give me a good start. Mm, What a valuable example of transitioning in a really smart way. Yeah. And I think a lot of people don't think about that. You know, they assume their employer will be angry that they're leaving or they assume that there won't be something that they could take with them. But, you know, look at the job that you have and see, is there any piece of it that would be really valuable to the company that you're leaving? And if you're leaving anyway, you know, you might as well try. The worst they can do is say no, and then you're going to be in the same position you would have been anyway. But I think it's a good strategy if you've got something to offer that you capitalize on that and and see if you can find a pathway to making that transition a little easier for yourself by pro- still providing a service to the one that employed you before. Oh, that's great advice. Did that former boss continue as a mentor even as you struck out on your own? He was really helpful in the very beginning because I would have weekly phone calls with him to go over the workers' comp claims. And he would always ask how my business was doing. And I was able to ask him some questions. And it's funny, I was just talking with my sales director um, the other day because she actually left that same company years later. And I heard that she had left and I contacted her and she came to work for us. And now she is over our entire sales team. And she worked in that same industry and people in that industry are really hard workers. But we were just talking the other day about how we really should um, call Steve up and schedule lunch and tell him all the things that we actually use in our business every single day today that we learned from him. Yeah, I'm sure that he would like to hear that and appreciate it. So Danielle, you've helped over 50,000 people over 15 years. I know that you teach a primer on Medicare for people around age 50. Where do you start? Yeah. The first part you have to do is get people to realize why they need it that early. I always say to folks when they're turning 65 and they're overwhelmed, I say, I've said this for years, I wish Medicare had a class that you could take when you were 50. And it could literally be just an hour. But the reason I want them to have this information earlier in life is because 
in my book, the first mistake that people make is they don't realize that Medicare isn't free. And so all our lives we work and we see these FICA taxes being taken out to fund our Social Security and Medicare in the future. And that leads us to believe that one day we're going to get Medicare and it's going to be paid for because we paid for these taxes all these years. And that's not correct. Those taxes go to pay for your Part A hospital benefits. But when you get onto Medicare, there's a monthly premium that you pay for your outpatient coverage and you pay that forever as long as you're on Medicare, which for almost everyone is for the rest of your life. That is a premium that you have to pay. And then Medicare doesn't cover everything. It only covers about 80% of outpatient costs. So you need to cover the other 20% or be able to buy an insurance policy like we sell to cover that for you. And if you don't know that until you're 65 and you're getting ready to retire, it can really put a damper on your financial plans for the future because you weren't expecting to spend 10 to 20% of your social security check on your health insurance. And if people know this earlier, as early as I can get them, uh, but 50 is the number I always like to say, it's early enough that you still have time to do something about it. So maybe you find this out a little earlier in life and you bump up that savings that you're putting away by a couple percentage points and you put away a little more than you were before because you don't want it to catch you off guard, surprise you, and then end up as I've seen many people do, getting ready to retire until you have that conversation with your Medicare broker. And then you say, you know what? I'm going to stay working for a few more years because I didn't know this and I haven't put away enough money to give up 10 to 20% of my social security check. So I want people to find this out sooner. I love it when I'm working with people who are the adult children of my clients and they're helping their parents make decisions. And they are in that 45 to 50 range. And I can educate them at the same time. And now they have a chance to do better maybe than what their parents did to save enough money so that when they find out that this stuff isn't free, that it's not completely panicking them or making them rethink the retirement plans. You have an example in your book of a woman who came to you and she was quite angry finding out that she had to actually pay expenses for premiums in retirement. How often or how many people do you come across that that is their experience? Many of them. You would be so surprised. It's surprising to me. But then if I think back to before I learned about Medicare, I guess I probably too had this vague idea in my head that someday when you're a senior citizen, the government provides your insurance and and you don't think about that you might have to pay for it. And so it's funny, some of the emails that we get, boy, people really go off on this stuff. They're usually very angry with the federal government because no one told them this. They didn't know about it and they don't think they should have to pay after working their whole lives and paying taxes in America. And so we see this happen all the time. And then also when I was working on my book, um, I put questions out. We have a large Facebook group and I put questions out to my own members of my Facebook group about what things surprise you the most. Why do you think you didn't know? And so many of them responded and said, yeah, I didn't know. I didn't know anything about Medicare costing money. I'm glad that I'm you know, learning about it now. But many of them are in that situation. And it's just that occasionally we have one that's really funny with how they phrase it, uh, like the person that I featured in the book. Okay. So mistake number one, Medicare is not free. We will say that clearly for everyone. And knowledge is power, right? As you said, the earlier that you start understanding how Medicare works, you can plan accordingly so that by age 65, you've got your ducks in a row. Maybe we should just start with the basics. What are the four parts of Medicare? Original Medicare was created in 1965 and rolled out by President Johnson. And it had two parts, A and B, because they were modeled after the old Blue Cross and Blue Shield plans, a hospital benefit and an outpatient benefit. Your hospital insurance pays for inpatient hospital, skilled nursing facility, hospice benefits. And that's the part that you pay taxes for your whole working life so that when you do join Medicare eventually at age 65 or beyond, you don't pay anything for the hospital insurance itself. And that might sound really good. And you think if I'm a pretty healthy person, maybe I could get away with just having part A. But there are things that happen in a hospital setting that fall under part B, which is outpatient coverage, such as outpatient surgery, chemotherapy, radiation, durable medical equipment that's provided, 
things like oxygen, MRI, CT scans. These are all things that you might think hospital insurance would cover, but are more often covered under Part B. And that's the part where you're going to pay a premium. So in 2020, the base premium for Part B is $144.60 per month. And the average Social Security check is around $1,400. So just that base premium right there alone is going to be 10% of your Social Security income. If you're an average Social Security earner, if you're on the low end, it might even eat up more of that check. And that's what most people pay for Medicare. But if you are in a higher income bracket and you have earned more than $87,000 as an individual filer or $174,000 as a married filer, then you will actually pay more. And it can be significantly more if you're in the top bracket, you spend $491 and some change per month for your outpatient coverage for Medicare. And so if you didn't know that going in, or if you planned for $144, but you're really in a higher bracket, then right away from the beginning, you're kind of unprepared. Those two parts uh, make up what we call original Medicare or traditional Medicare. And you can add on what's called a Medicare supplement or Medigap plan, private coverage, to fill in some of the gaps, to pay for the deductibles, to pay for the 20% that the Part B doesn't cover. Um, these are things that you learn about once you kind of get the basics down. But then in two, 1997, uh, Bill Clinton signed the Balanced Budget Act, which created the Medicare, uh, what was called the Medicare Choice Program back then. But eventually it evolved into what we know as Part C or the Medicare Advantage Program today. And that's optional. You could choose to get your Medicare Part A and B benefits through a local private insurance company and you use their network of providers and it works like your group insurance where you have co-pays as you go along. And some people will choose that option because uh, the premiums for a Medicare Advantage plan are usually significantly cheaper than what you would pay for a Medicare supplement or Medigap to supplement your original Medicare. But there's pros and cons to that, of course, because maybe you travel a lot and you do a lot of, or you live an RV style um, life or you snowbird. Well, then a plan that has just a local network may not be a good fit for you. So Part C was created as an option. It's something you can choose or not choose. And then probably the most important aspect of Medicare that's changed in recent years is that in 2006, they added the Medicare Part D program to cover prescriptions. And before that, for more than 40 years, people on Medicare had no significant prescription drug coverage. So we had people back in 2005 that would pay eight, ten thousand dollars a month for their diabetes medications. And uh, I'm sorry, eight, eight to ten per year. And so we're talking about hundreds and hundreds of dollars for these expensive medications. And you know, ask yourself if you had a bill for medication that cost you eight to ten thousand dollars per year, that would significantly eat into your retirement savings. And so Part D was really important to the whole big picture so that people can voluntarily purchase prescription drug coverage that will help them to cover the cost of those medications and make them less expensive than if you were paying cash. And so those are the four parts of Medicare. And we encourage people to get those down to really learn about them and how they work before you even move on to the idea of choosing a Medicare supplement versus a Medicare Advantage plan. The supplemental insurance is important and you'll learn about that, but you need to first know how your government benefits work, what it covers, what it doesn't, so that you can make a good choice between whether you want to enroll in a Medicare supplement and stick with original Medicare, or if you prefer to get your benefits through a local network under the Advantage program. Okay, that's great. So part A is inpatient hospital coverage. You've got part B, which is outpatient coverage. Uh, You mentioned some of the applications being chemo, radiation, dialysis. I think also thrown in there would be ambulance transportation, physical therapy, speech therapy, right? Yep, that's right. And all of those things will typically fall under Part B. So it's so important that you have both A and B. Yeah. And then you've got Part C. That sounds to be either you're going to a private insurance company. That that's to fill the gap. Yeah. So um, the things that Medicare doesn't cover, uh, like deductibles, coinsurance, and copays, 
There's two ways to get help for paying with those things. One is the Medigap plan, or you could do Medicare Advantage. But in that in that world, it does help fill the gaps in that you're getting your benefits through a local private network, but you'll have copays as you go along. So it's just a different way of going about getting those gaps covered. Got it. And then Part D, that sounds like Part A and B also provided directly from the government. That's for drugs. It does sound like that. And you would think that, but actually because Part D was tacked on many years later after Medicare was first created, you buy Part D from a private insurance company, just like you would the Medicare Advantage or Medigap plan. So the government regulates it and they'll penalize you if you don't enroll and you don't have other coverage. And then later you decide to join, you'll pay a late penalty, but you actually choose your Part D plan from a private insurance company. And most states have 20 or 30 plans to choose from. Thank you for reviewing all the four parts. That's helpful. When you started looking into Medicare because your clients were asking you about it, as a federal program, is reading about all this stuff kind of like studying for a driver's test? Like <laughs> as you're trying to educate yourself, it's it's just like a lot of legal stuff, right? Yes. And that's just a brilliant point because I always lead my webinars and seminars with, I open up with saying something like, I know that you've just been on pins and needles all week waiting for this exciting seminar about Medicare. <laughs> and everyone laughs because nobody wants to learn about Medicare. It's just like auto insurance. We do it because we have to, but we certainly don't want to learn all that. We really want someone else to just choose it for us, like our employers have done our whole lives. But you don't have that option with Medicare. You've got to figure it out. So you do have to sit down and learn some of this stuff that's a little bit tedious, these big words that go along with insurance. And um, something that is also important is not to put the cart before the horse, you know, learn the basics first so that you understand what the government gives you. Then you can learn about the other things that are going to happen on the back end. But you can see, right, why people aren't that excited to learn about Medicare. Coming up, how much will you need for health care in retirement? Medigap plans, Advantage plans, Part D, all that and so much more right after this short break. The show notes for this episode can be found at inspiredmoney.fm slash 165. If you're listening in your car or wherever you are, check the show notes if you want to learn more about Danielle, Boomer benefits, and all other things mentioned in this episode. It's time for the Runnymede Money Tip of the Week. Are you a minimalist, hoarder, or somewhere in between? What if we set a new resolution to minimize our possessions? I'm trying to be neater. Getting organized means getting rid of old stuff. Marie Kondo style can be hard. She wants you to make a pile and get rid of anything that doesn't spark joy. That can feel like ripping the band-aid off at once. That's hard and it can hurt. What if we remove one item each day for the next 365 days? This weekend I sold a step two roller coaster that the kids used to love but have long outgrown. I sold it on Facebook Marketplace for $25. You should have seen the number of messages that I got. Apparently I priced it too low. I would have been happy just to give it away for free to reclaim the space in my storeroom. I consider that $25 a bonus. One item a day feels like a simple and satisfying way to declutter at a steady pace. Think about the annual impact of getting rid of an average of five items per week. This process doesn't have to be a mad frenzy that disrupts your entire life or household. It's a gradual approach that can change the way you think about stuff. It definitely helps you be more thoughtful about what you buy. And that's critical here. If you want to get rid of clutter, you've got to stop the flow of stuff coming in. Get rid of your junk pile or that box or maybe boxes of stuff that you packed up but never unpacked the last time you moved. I want to enjoy my possessions, not be a slave to them. Getting rid of stuff that you don't need can be a way to help prioritize what's important to you. It might even help define what wealth means to you. Getting rid of unwanted stuff can make you feel wealthier. That's the Runnymede Money Tip of the Week.
Inspired Money is brought to you by Runnymede Capital Management. We help you to plan, invest, and worry less. Our Inspired Money Maker of the Week is Chuck Feeney. I don't think Chuck listens to this podcast, but he was an inspiration for me launching this show. He's the embodiment of Inspired Money. If you don't know him, he's a billionaire who amassed his fortune as a co-founder of the airport duty-free shops that he started in 1960. He made billions, but lived a life of monk-like frugality. As a philanthropist, he pioneered the idea of giving while living, spending most of your fortune on big, hands-on charity donations instead of funding a foundation upon death. Over the last four decades, Chuck Feeney has donated more than $8 billion to charity, universities, and foundations worldwide through his foundation, the Atlantic Philanthropies. Forbes called him the James Bond of philanthropy because he almost always made his donations anonymously with little to no fanfare. I love his understated profile and oversized impact. Chuck's generosity even influenced Bill Gates and Warren Buffett. On September 14th, 2020, at age 89, Feeney completed his four-decade mission and signed the documents to shutter the Atlantic Philanthropies. He successfully has gifted his fortune away. Feeney summarized his mission in a few sentences. I see little reason to delay giving when so much good can be achieved through supporting worthwhile causes. Besides, it's a lot more fun to give while you live than give while you're dead. I'll link to an article if you want to read more. I think there's a documentary too. I'll link to that if I can find it. Inspired Moneymaker, what are you doing to inspire and make an impact? If you want to be a future Inspired Money Maker of the Week, reach out. Email me at inspiredmoney.fm slash Andy. Tell me what you like about the show and what you're doing to make a bigger impact with your money. As always, I'd appreciate it if you write a review wherever you listen or at podchaser.com. Every review makes my day, whether it's five stars or even one. You're listening to Inspired Money. I'm Andy Wong. It's super important, right? Because what is the estimated cost of healthcare in retirement? There's actually a study that was put out by Fidelity and they update it every couple of years. And currently you can expect to spend a 65 year old couple that is new to Medicare and getting ready to retire can expect between them to spend about $300,000 on their health care um, between the time that they join Medicare at 65 and they pass away. So it's a huge, significant amount of money that you need to have set away. Huge number. Okay. So we need to understand how Medicare works. I know the timing's important. So you need to enroll in certain programs within a certain time period. What do people need to know there? So Medicare has enrollment periods and this works a little bit like you might remember at your employer. Once a year, they come around and say, hey, it's open enrollment. Here's what the plan's going to cost. Here's what your payroll deduction will be if you choose this plan over this plan. And you have this open enrollment period once a year where you can make changes. You can add your kids, you can drop your kids, you can change from one plan to another. And Medicare has something similar in that you have a an initial enrollment period for joining Medicare itself. And that happens around your 65th birthday. It starts three months before your 65th birthday. It goes through that birthday month and then three months after. And during that seven month window, you can sign up for Medicare parts A, B, C, and D. You could choose what you want, but everybody needs to sign up for A and B if they don't have any other coverage. So if you don't have an employer providing coverage, if you're not working past 65, then you need to enroll in at least parts A and B. And then of course, you have the option of choosing C and D if you want to. So everyone gets that initial seven month window and you want to enroll on time so that you don't get smacked with late penalties later on. And of course, that can be even a little tricky itself because if you're still working, you may wonder, do I need to enroll in Medicare at 65? What happens if I don't? Will there be a late penalty? And so learning those enrollment periods and when to do them and how to do them properly is a really important piece of educating yourself about Medicare. And then of course, once you have your policies in place, then there are other open enrollment periods. There's an open enrollment period in the fall where you can change your drug plan from year to year and a couple of other election periods that you just need to know about in case you need to make a change with your coverage. 
What is your general recommendation for people? Because you did mention that, you know, certain parts of the plan are optional. I would assume that oftentimes it's better to take like a lower cost plan part of that so that you maintain it rather than giving it up. But what what are the general recommendations? At the very least, you need to get yourself enrolled in Medicare Parts A and B. And then if you don't have any other coverage, you know, for instance, a veteran could choose to get their benefits through the VA and they might not enroll in Medicare. We do advise that they do. So they have a civilian option, but some of them might not. And there are things like that, that you might have retiree coverage provided by a former employer. We don't see that quite as often today, but maybe you have something like that and and that may affect what you do. But enrolling in Medicare parts A and B, it's really important that you don't just leave yourself uncovered for that other percent because something tricky about Medicare that's different than what you've had before is that when we're younger, we have a plan that has a deductible and then we pay some co-insurance. And then after a certain amount of spending by us, we hit what's called a maximum out-of-pocket limit. And if you hit that, then you're done spending for the year. For instance, my current deductible, I think on my plan is 3,500, then I pay 20%. But if I end up spending 6,000 total out-of-pocket in a year, then my insurance company kicks in and pays for 100% for everything the rest of the year. Well, Medicare doesn't work like that. When you have Medicare Part B covering your outpatient coverage, Medicare pays 80% after you satisfy the deductible. You pay the 20% forever with no cap. And just imagine what that bill might look like if you were pretty healthy, so you decided not to enroll in any supplemental insurance. And then a few years later, you are diagnosed with lymphoma and you have to go for treatment down at MD Anderson here in Texas, arguably one of the best cancer hospitals in the world. That's going to be thousands and thousands of dollars. So you don't want to leave yourself uncovered as difficult as it is learning the different options between a Medicare supplement and a Medicare Advantage plan, you want to choose one or the other because a Medicare supplement is going to very comprehensively pay for most of the gaps in Medicare. And uh, then you don't have to be in the hospital wondering what kind of bills you're going to have in your mailbox when you get out. They cost more, but they're very predictable in what they'll pay on the back end. Or you can do the Medicare Advantage coverage. So even if you don't have a lot to spend on coverage, one good thing about Medicare is even people who have just Social Security alone and no retirement savings could afford to enroll in a Medicare Advantage plan and get their benefits through a a local network. Some of those plans have what we call a zero premium, which means when you join the plan, you don't pay anything other than what you're already paying for Part B, and you agree to use that local network. Those plans do have a maximum out-of-pocket limit on them to cap your spending. So you will have one route or the other to go. And we tell people, if you can see the value in paying a monthly premium and having very little spending on the back end and being able to see any doctor that you want on Medicare, a Medicare supplement is a great value. But if you don't want to spend that much money per month on a Medigap plan, or maybe you're really healthy and you don't see the doctor a lot, you don't want to spend, say, $100, $150 a month on a Medigap plan, you could at least choose a local Advantage plan. You're going to have lower premiums. You'll have some copays as you go along. But most people are used to that with their group insurance. They've done that for years. And now we've capped that 20%. We're never going to have to spend beyond a certain limit provided by the plan. That's the most important part that we try to get across to people is don't think to yourself that you can wait until you get sick and then just buy the coverage because it doesn't work like that. There are enrollment windows that expire and then there are certain times of years when you can get into certain plans and not others. So you, you want to have something in place to stop the bleeding, I guess I would say at some point. Um, And then of course, you'll have options to make changes to that later, depending on what state you live in and what kind of policy you purchased up front. But you don't want to just think to yourself, well, I have Medicare, I'll be fine. And then find out when it's too late to buy a plan that that 20% isn't capped. The 80% coverage sounds really good until you think about how much a knee replacement is or hip replacement or your example, you're getting chemo or cancer treatment that's so expensive. Clearly, you need that extra level of coverage. When it comes to things like vision, dental, and hearing, do you get coverage from the Medicare Advantage program? 
So you do, if you chose to enroll in a Medicare Advantage plan, one of the things that people like about Advantage plans is that they can include what are called ancillary benefits. And original Medicare doesn't have these. So if you enroll in a Medicare Advantage plan, you'll get a summary of benefits and it'll show you what you pay for a variety of different kinds of services. For instance, maybe it says an ambulance ride is $200. You pay $200 a night if you go in the hospital doctor visit is $10 for your primary care, $50 for a specialist, but they can also include dental vision and hearing. And one thing people are often surprised about is why would the government not provide dental vision and hearing to me at 65 when I most would need this type of coverage? And the answer is that back in the 60s when Medicare was created, it wasn't commonplace for group company health employer coverage to provide dental vision and hearing. Those benefits just weren't normally included in those. And so they never thought about it. People paid for those things separately. They often didn't need them as much because people had a shorter life expectancy. So they may not have ever gotten to needing hearing aids. Well, today things are different and we are used to having those benefits included. And so if you find an Advantage plan that you really like, and maybe it has a preventive dental benefit that'll at least pay for two teeth cleanings a year, maybe it gives you a 20% discount on hearing aids, those kind of things that are built into the plan might sway you to joining an Advantage plan with the network and getting those extra benefits added in. Okay. Before we talk a little bit more about Medigap, I know that Part D, since it's the newest part of Medicare, you had in your book that more than 70% of beneficiaries participate in Part D, which is great because drugs are very expensive. People often get confused because the Plan D changes benefits annually, and that confuses people. That's correct. So your Medigap plans don't change benefits annually, but Advantage plans and Part D plans do. So let's say you have a Part D plan and you like it very well and it's going along fine. And so you think, I'll just keep this plan. Well, that plan is going to change next year. And so it's really important that you review your coverage every September. They send out a letter called an annual notice of change. And it tells you, here's what's changing in your Part D plan or your Medicare Advantage plan for next year. It will tell you if drugs are being added to the formulary or being dropped. Really important that you know if one of your important medications isn't going to be covered next year. But they also might move a medication from, say, Tier 2 to Tier 4, which makes that drug a lot more expensive for you. And so you have this annual election period in the fall from October 15th to December 7th where you can make a change from one plan to another. So imagine that you were somebody um, that was diabetic and you take a, a drug like Genuvia, which is expensive, and you find out that your current plan isn't going to cover it for the following year. Now you have time during the annual election period to run a search on Medicare's website to find a different plan that will still cover that medication and your other medications as well. And so if you didn't know about that annual election period, you might just keep your plan and think everything would be fine. But then in January, you go up to the pharmacy counter and the pharmacist tells you that drug will be $500 because you didn't check to see that the company was going to continue to cover it the following year. Or you might see your premium go from $20 to $60, but you never opened the annual notice of change packet. And so one of the mistakes that people make uh, because of exactly what we mentioned earlier about Medicare not being very fun or exciting to learn about, uh, they don't do anything with the packet. They never review it. And then in January, it's too late to make a change to your party drug plan. So super important that you review that coverage year to year. It sounds like retirement will never be boring. (laughs) You'll have a lot of reading to do. Let's put it that way. (laughs) Okay. For planning purposes, what kind of assumptions do you guide your clients through? Like how much money should they be setting aside so that they're going to be able to have adequate coverage in retirement? Yeah. If we get people early enough, I love to tell them, listen, you're going to need at least $144 a month to pay for Part B. You probably are going to want a drug plan. The average premium for a standalone Part D drug plan is around $35. There are some plans cheaper, some plans that cost a lot more. But if we average everyone across the nation, it's around $35. So if we put those two numbers together, you can see that you're going to have, you're going to need just under $200 to pay for the basics. Part B and Part D. And that's if you're not someone that's high income in one of the higher tiers uh, for the premiums. 
So we know that you're going to spend that and then you're going to just be deciding, can I afford another hundred plus dollars to get a Medigap plan? Or do I want to look at an Advantage plan, maybe get a little bit cheaper premium and pay more as I go along? So when we talk to them about it, we tell them you're going to need at least the 180 to $200 a month for the basics. And then if you have enough room to add on a Medigap plan, that's going to be $300 a month. And you have to remember that's per person. So each of you have your own separate social security checks. You're going to have your own separate premiums. And if you were a couple together and you wanted to go and get that full coverage and the most full coverage supplement, you could easily spend more than $600 a month on your health insurance in retirement. And so have you put enough money away for that? Have you and your financial planner talked about how you're going to to meet that particular piece of the puzzle when it comes to your golden years? And if you haven't, then you need to figure out how much do I need to be putting away now so that I'm um, not walking into this in retirement with nothing to help me pay those premiums. Yeah, that's definitely a necessary line item in one's planning. How are the Medicare premiums affected by higher income. I saw in your book that you have a pro tip that you can file to appeal if you have like a life-changing event that affects your income because it's calculated based on when you're working. Yeah. So because um, the, the social security office is the one that has to calculate what your Medicare premiums are, they are going to look at what your tax returns are. And they're always looking at a tax return, usually from two years prior. So right now in 2020, they're basing your premiums off what you earned in 2018. And so if you were still working in 2018, but now you're retired and your Medicare Part B premiums are based on that 2018 income, meaning Social Security is telling you your premium is going to be more. Maybe they say, your premium is going to be $289 for Part B based on the bracket that you're in. If you can show Social Security that now you have retired and you don't earn as much as you did back in 2018, they can consider reducing that premium for you. Now, they do get an update from the IRS every year. And so they'll update this automatically once a year for you, but you don't have to wait for that two-year period to catch up. And we did this with my mom. She earned more before she retired. And so we filed a reconsideration request form with Social Security. We showed them this is what she was earning when she was working. Here's what she has now. Her monthly income from her Social Security is X. This is how much she has coming out from her IRAs and showed them that she she and her husband were under the limit and they immediately reduced that premium for her. So it's good to know that you have that option of explaining to the social security why you legitimately should have a lower premium for Part B than what they're assessing. Yeah. That adjustment could make a big difference in somebody's retirement. Yeah. It could be thousands and thousands of dollars depending on how much you were earning before. So it's always something to look at. And um, each year they change the limits a little bit. So if you were in a higher bracket, you could check the following year to see if anything has changed on what the upper earning limits are before they start assessing those. So if you are someone that's paying more, you want to keep an eye on that. That's great. What do people need to know about Medigap plants? So the main thing to know about Medigap is they are more expensive than an Advantage plan, but there's really some important benefits that you get. First of all, Medicare has over 1 million providers in the United States. And if you purchase a Medigap plan, you can see any of those providers and no referrals necessary, no need to choose a primary care doctor. It doesn't matter if you bought your Medigap plan from Blue Cross or Aetna or Mutual of Omaha or one of 30 other carriers that I could quote you. Your network per se is original Medicare. So any provider in the US that accepts Medicare will accept your Medigap plan no matter who you purchase it from. And the really good thing about that is Taking my example of my own insurance with a $3,500 deductible, if I were to buy a Medigap Plan G, my deductible would be $198 per year. And then after that, my Medigap Plan G would pick up all of the other costs. So I could go to the doctor and pay nothing, go and have surgery and pay nothing, have a hip replacement, pay nothing, eight weeks of chemotherapy, pay nothing. I would have nothing out of pocket on A and B services. My only other expenses would be for things that fall outside of Medicare 
or for drugs on my Part D plan, I'm going to have copays there. Um, that kind of coverage can really go a long way towards someone's peace of mind. And so maybe you are someone that just likes the surety of that and you're willing to spend a little more money to have the access, not have a network and have access to all these providers and have really full coverage. Or maybe you're someone with poor health and you see a lot of specialists well, in that case, spending a little more for a Medigap plan will really be in your best interest instead of being on a Medicare Advantage plan that has lower premiums, but you've got a 40 or $50 copay every time you see that specialist. So you have to run the numbers and then decide if the extra expense of a Medigap plan really makes sense for you. Um, currently, statistically, uh, about one third of beneficiaries choose the Medicare Advantage plans. And that is trending upward. They're very popular because of the low premiums. But in our agency, I would say only 10 to 15% of our clients choose the Advantage plans. And it's usually because I'm explaining all of these things about the network and what you deal with with an Advantage plan. So people get a little more information up front and they feel more confident in going the Medigap route. They don't either like the network or they find out their doctors aren't in the network. And those would be reasons why you might decide against an Advantage plan over the more expensive Medigap option. It sounds like one really needs to look at what their needs are as well as their resources, what they can afford. Absolutely. You need to look at your needs and your budget. And th there might be a situation where you can only afford one type of coverage over another. That certainly plays into it. But it, it could also be a situation where you've got the choice and then you're going to be thinking about your own medical usage and what you'll spend. And if it makes if it makes sense to you or comforts you to have that higher uh, level of coverage, then you could certainly choose that. That's great information. Anything else that you think the listener you want to leave them with as far as Medicare is concerned? Well, we talked about learning the basics up front and we talked about um, putting some thought into the spending and choosing which routes that you go and learning all the enrollment periods. And something else I would share is that when you're sitting down to make your plans for your Medicare coverage, prepare yourself with a list of doctors that you have, their contact phone numbers, make a list of the medications that you take. And then you can either do this on your own uh, by calling your own doctor's offices and going to Medicare's website with the drug information, or you can contact a broker. One of the things that will help you decide which route that you'll go is calling your doctor's offices and finding out which plans they take. You might have a doctor that doesn't take any Medicare Advantage plans. Now you've narrowed your choices. If you want to keep that doctor, a Medigap plan is what you're looking at. And so you can make things a little easier on yourself by writing all that information down ahead of time, making some phone calls to your providers to find out which types of coverage they take. And by this, you're sort of winnowing down the choices that you have until you find the one that's a perfect fit. That sounds like practical advice that will clarify things very quickly. I mean, it's easy to get overwhelmed trying to read about how the plan works, but when you make that list and see who the doctor you've been going to for many years, what medicines you're taking, very quickly you can know um, what's covered and what's not. Absolutely. And you don't want to leave any of those things out. So it's so important to take your time and do it right. Great advice. Danielle, I like to ask all the Inspired Money guests, how do you define success? For me, success is not just about the earning potential um, of a business, but how you're perceived in the community and what your brand reputation is, is super important to us. I love providing a service where we go above and beyond on delivery of not just the policy's benefits, but all the little hiccups that happen on the back end. Medicare denies a claim and you don't know why. Your doctor built something wrong and now you're getting a bill in the mail and you're not sure who to call first. Or you're standing at the pharmacy at four o'clock on a Friday and they're telling you your Part D drug won't fill this medication for you. People can be a little bewildered and they don't know who to call. And so we've set our agency up to where they call us and we coordinate all that for you. So it's a one phone number, one place that you go and let me get my experts on the phone, the conference and the right people to help you determine, do you owe that bill? Did something uh, get billed wrong? Was there a legitimate reason uh, why your Part D plan won't fill the medication or are you just in your deductible period? 
I love the surety and the confidence that our clients have in that they don't have to worry about those questions. They can just call us. Um, it certainly costs us a lot of money in a client service team that we provide, but I love, love, love reading the reviews or seeing the comments that people make in the Facebook group and knowing that someone on my team took something that is so overwhelming and confusing and made it easier for them. That's got to be as an entrepreneur, the number one piece of success is doing something really good for your community of clients. And I would say that it's equally as important as the financial success that you get out of your business. Well, thank you for sharing your story about business and also covering an often confusing topic and simplifying it for us. I I can say that I really enjoy your book, 10 Costly Mistakes You Can't Afford to Make. It is educational and I like the way it's laid out. You have takeaways, you have pro tips. So I feel like one can use it as a guide to navigate Medicare. But it also is it's a reference that when you have questions, you can go back and look things up. I, I know that you also have a lot of resources at your website. Can you tell the Inspired Money listener where to find out more to follow you and get more information? Of course. And thank you. So we are very easy to find um, online. We are boomerbenefits.com. So boomer like baby boomer boomerbenefits.com. We have a website with tons of great blog posts. You can sign up for a Medicare 101 webinar where you can come and learn in a in an environment uh, at no charge to you. There's email courses that we provide so that people can learn in whichever format they learn best in. And then on social media, you can find us almost anywhere, YouTube, Facebook. We have a private Facebook group where you can join and have your Medicare questions answered. And it'll be Boomer Benefits on any of those channels as well. Great. I'll put those all in the show notes. Thanks so much, Danielle. Thank you for having me. So what was your favorite Inspired Money moment? I just love how Danielle niched down from selling term and group insurance to specializing in Medicare. I'm sure her agency can handle all kinds of insurance products, but niching down makes for powerful marketing and branding to help baby boomers. It's a smart move, and I'm sure one of the many reasons why she's grown to 65 employees and over 30,000 policyholders. If you had a different favorite Inspired Money moment, please let me know. I'd love to hear from you and we'll give you a shout out here on the podcast. I'll also mail you an Inspired Money sticker or button. If you want to challenge yourself to do one thing that scares you every day, sign up for the free Inspired Money Fear Challenge at inspiredmoney.fm slash challenge. Inspired Money is edited by Christopher Wright of Wright Media. Thank you so much for joining me. If you haven't yet subscribed, please do it right now wherever you listen to make sure that you won't miss next week's show. I'll see you then. The music you're listening to right now and all other music on today's show is by the amazing Jim Kimo West. Have an inspired week and do something that scares you because that's where the magic happens. (laughs) 